May it please the court, Marilyn Day, Assistant Prosecuting Attorney, representing the people of the state of Michigan and the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. I would like to reserve two minutes of my time for rebuttal. In this state, it is unlawful for a person to operate a vehicle while intoxicated upon a highway or other place open to the general public or generally accessible to motor vehicles, including an area designated for the parking of vehicles. The question for this court to decide is whether the location where defendant was operating his vehicle, his driveway, was generally accessible to motor vehicles. In essence, the Michigan legislature has already answered this question based on the definition of private driveway under the Motor Vehicle Code. The Motor Vehicle Code defines a private driveway as any piece of privately owned and maintained property used for vehicular traffic, but is not open or normally used by the public. If the legislature has already defined a private driveway as being used for vehicular traffic, it by necessity is generally accessible to motor vehicles. And it does not matter whether that particular area is also open or normally used by the public, because in 1992, the reach of the operating while intoxicated statute was amended to include the language generally accessible to motor vehicles. And an area that's generally accessible to motor vehicles need not also be open to the public because the two phrases are disjunctive phrases based on the use of the conjunction or. Therefore, this case should be easy for this court to resolve because the legislature has identified a piece of property, a private driveway, as, as being open for vehicular traffic and the legislature does not require that it also be open or normally used by the public. The plain language of the statute also uh, is consistent with this analysis. If you look at the word generally, the dictionary definition means usually, ordinarily, or for the most part. Accessible means able to be reached, accessed, or used. A private residential driveway is usually, ordinarily, or for the most part, able to be used or reached by a motor vehicle. It is not the unrestricted number of potential users. I just have to ask a question. Um, and first of all, thank you for being here. And I guess the, the question I just want to start with is, Help me to understand, and I've been pondering this case, and I'm just trying to gather, how is this not an example of governmental overreach? It, it is, a, the legislature has the discretion to regulate public policy. Um, this is just under the uh, operating while intoxicated statute. Under the DNR code, under uh, the Environmental Protection Act, if you're driving a snowmobile anywhere in the state, you can be criminally liable. It's the police, it's a police action, the public policy, and the legislative policy in order to um, so let promote me, Let me do a quick hypothetical. And this is kind of what, and, and, I, and I want you to kind of help me through this. So this is my hypothetical. Let's say you have college students, and they're graduating, and they're having kind of a graduation party, right? And they're on a large property, very large property and they're down at the lake and they're having a great time and they have their car and they have the keys in the ignition of the car because they want to listen to music. And the car then is, uh, is on because the keys are in the ignition and they're listening to music and they're using the car as a radio to kind of enjoy the music of the day. Under that situation, since the keys are in the ignition, they're on private property, they're far away from a public road, could they then be held liable? Well, it's not, that is not the issue before this court, but I will answer it to the best of my ability. First, the issue is whether the person was actually operating the vehicle. And right, the, I, I know. And there is no, there has no case law that says the mere fact that your keys in the ignition means you're operating the vehicle. So that's one hurdle that you would have to over, uh, overcome. Right, let's, this just, let's, just change, let's just change hypothetical for a second. Let's just say then they, they move the car, uh, you know, a short distance, but it's on private property to get it closer to the lake. I think if the, if the property was being used at that moment for vehicular tra traffic, then potentially, yes, you could um, charge someone in that particular situation. Because if you look at the word generally accessible to motor vehicle, generally it's not a limitation. Uh, it's actually an expansion of the word accessible. Any area basically that's accessible to motor vehicles would fall within the statute. But I want to get back to this particular situation because we are dealing with a driveway. 
which by its own, the meaning of the word, it's used for vehicular traffic. And if we look at driveways in other areas that are meant to be used for vehicular traffic, it is clear that the plain language of the statute applies. As I was indicating, to uh, Justice Bernstein, I, I, I think maybe what you said is a little broader than what I expected you to say. So it, it sounded to me like what you said is if it's accessible to motor vehicles at all. So in Justice Bernstein's hypothetical, there's a grassy area. It's not on a road. They've driven off the road through the grass down to some lake. And the mere fact that a motor vehicle can ex can access the place is sufficient, then if that's right, then what is what, what is generally doing? Well, generally is an expansion. Like in our particular case, there is some, um, it hasn't been fully identified in the facts, but there is some um, evidence that the police car was, might have been blocking defendant's driveway. At that particular moment, his driveway might not have been accessible to motor vehicles, but it's generally accessible to motor vehicles. And I think generally can, use, to be, can be used broadly, like a, a, a community that has a gate. Okay. I'm sorry? Would you please speak into the microphone? Yes. Like a community that has a gate. All right. Once you get inside the gate, that area is generally accessible to motor vehicles, but there are restrictions on how you can get into that area. It is generally accessible to 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 so to I, motor vehicles. So that under point. your definition, you would have us read the statute to say you can be liable by definition anywhere that you could have been found to be drunk driving. I don't, is a place that falls within the statute. So I, the statute covers the universe of places that a car could potentially go. There's no restriction I, in the statute. I, I don't want to um, have this court reach that point because I know it would be problematic f to get the necessary uh, votes, particularly for that particular uh, argument. What I want to focus on is when we're dealing with an area that we know is used for vehicular traffic, which it would be inside of a gated community or a paved driveway. Any place that we know is accessible to, to motor vehicles clearly falls within the plain language of the statute. And this is a MOA, so we're talking about, and the question to be asked is whether the private driveway is generally accessible to motor vehicles. It is, because it does not matter, it does not matter that it, they're, they're or restrictions or the, the fact that people are restricted from a particular area is not what is meant by the word generally accessible to motor that's exactly, vehicles. That's exactly what we're trying to figure out, right? I mean, if, that, if it were that easy, we, you guys probably wouldn't be here. We, we probably could have just figured it out and written something. But so, so, you're, so what work generally does is the question, I think, I think that's the question for everybody. Um, and I, I looked at that snowmobile statute too. I got interested in snowmobiles. Boating, uh, yeah. off-road vehicles, and they all have a much easier statute. I found myself thinking, why didn't the legislature make it easy here? If well, you just said, don't do it, anytime you're drunk and you're on a snowmobile, you're guilty, that's really easy. But here, they didn't do that. So we have to try and give meaning to all the pieces of the statute. And the, the first two clauses seem to be re relevant to any driving anywhere that's public. Correct. And then this one, is supposed to give meaning to driving places that are not public. You can't drive any private place drunk and get away with it. I, it but, but, but what work generally does is the question. You keep saying it expands accessible, and I, I'm not quite following that. Because to me, if it's accessible at all, then, then my, yard, it's, my yard's accessible, then you could drive anywhere. But generally feels to me like it should well, contain it a little bit. Well, in, the, in this period, and, and it's not, it doesn't depend on who is actually driving. Like so, in, so, so, the, so the definition of generally is not dependent on who has access, got you there, but does it, how does it expand accessible instead of oh, only The only way it expands accessible is when we're talking about an area that's currently not accessible, okay? Like I said, like the driveway that has a temporary obstruction. Security. That is how you are. Yes. 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 That is how you expand it in, in that particular meaning. You can expand it in that particular meaning. But I do agree, and I don't want to get into every any every place in the, in, in the, in the state of Michigan is open to um, is generally accessible in motor vehicles because, as, as everybody recognizes, the legislature would have potentially have said, you know, 
within the state, like they did for the commercial vehicles. We have to write an opinion that is going to address these situations. And so I just want you to know, last night I had dinner with some students from out there, from St. Michael's Academy and Petoskey High School and Charlevoix High School, and they inspired a question. And it's in long lines with what everyone else is asking. As it relates to private property, where exactly would you have us draw the line for generally accessible to motor vehicle? Where would it end? Do so you have, let me finish. They described it <laughs> as they're talking about this. There's a driveway, a cement driveway, and then the cement driveway ends, and then there's a dirt road, and the dirt road goes on for several hundred yards, and then there's a garage all the way at the end. Does it end at the cement portion? Does it take you to the dirt road? Or even if the dirt road stopped and then there was nothing but grass and there was still a, dry, a, a, a garage another 100 yards beyond, would that whole area be covered under this statute? I believe it would because that whole area is generally accessible to motor vehicles because you can operate your vehicle in that particular area. If there's sure signs of, of use of that motor vehicle being, being traveled on that particular area, then it's generally accessible to motor vehicles. But a driveway in and of itself is a, is a different story. And, it, and, the, and the issue we want, we do want some um, bright lines because like the police officer here, what was the police officer supposed to do? The argument by defendant is, okay, so he was too far back in his driveway, so that's not generally accessible. Well, how is the police officer gonna know what area specifically is generally accessible, especially in this case, when the driveway is relatively short, approximately 75 feet, and came a third of the way down, and he got so down. Help me to, but this is what I'm trying to get, get, gather, and and I think you know, I, I, I'm just trying to follow up on on um, the other justice's question, which is, what is what would not be accessible, generally accessible? Can you give me an example of a situation where? He wants to know where he can go drive drunk. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And, I'm, well, and, and I'm blind, so it only makes it even better. Yeah, well, so, <laughs> he can rack up the offenses. So well, what I mean, would not be accessible? Under this particular statute, because there's a whole different issue if you have an ATV, because if you have, even if you have a Jeep, nowhere in, in the state of Michigan can you drive off-road. No, a nice sedan. He, where can he drive his nice sedan drunk and get away with it? <laughs> yeah. What's the answer to that question? Well, I mean, I think the statute is very, very broad. Um, Basically, if it's usually ordinarily or the most part accessible to motor vehicles, I think the rule that we should apply here is if the area is it's meant or designed for vehicular traffic, then that it clearly falls within the statute. If it's meant or designed, or even if it's temporarily being used for vehicular traffic, if you're having a big party in the backyard and you're intending or you're meaning for that area to be used for vehicular traffic. The, spe the speedway in the Nickerson case, that might not always be accessible to motor vehicles, but they were meaning intending that that area to be accessible to motor vehicles. So I think if, if it's specifically designed or meant to be used for vehicular traffic, then it falls within the statute. If, even if it's temporarily being used for vehicular traffic, then it would fall within the statute. Um, now, I, I would like to point, direct your attention to a different definition of generally that, um, that the Court of Appeals looked to which talks about to or by most people or widely or popularly or extensively, which seems, if you put that before um, the word accessible, seems to speak to the expected volume of activity on the private property at issue. And you referenced the Nickerson case. That case involved a, a, the pit area of a speedway. And the Court of Appeals um, said that the pit area is a place where vehicles are routinely permitted to enter for the purpose of driving and parking, which again, in my mind, speaks to some expected volume of activity. So my question to you is, if the legislature extended the coverage of the statute in 1992 to cover private or at least non-public um, properties, uh, did it, is it your position that it covers all non-public properties and therefore covers everything, or that it covers some and not others, and if so, we're, you know, my, my operating theory is maybe we should draw the line based on this expected volume of activity, and I guess the question is why would you reject that? I disagree with this expected volume of activity. Why? Because that is, you're looking at the open to the public. If you're looking at the language open to the public, that is, that well, is it's, expected it's, before activity. You, before you get there, it's certainly possible to have private property not open to the public, but that would have a higher volume of activity. And again, in Nickerson, 
um, talked about the purpose of, of the statute. This construction is in accord with the purpose, which is to prevent the collision of a vehicle being operated by a person under the influence with other persons or, um, or property. So it seems reasonable to me to think that the legislature might have been thinking of extending the statute onto private or non-public property, but only when there's going to be some amount of activity where they were, that type of protection would need to occur. Why, why am I wrong? Because you have to look at the plain language of the statute. It says generally accessible to motor vehicles. It does not say generally accessible to the public. Generally accessible to motor vehicles means it could be defendant's own motor vehicle. It does not matter whether it was defendant, an invited guest, or even an alleged trespasser who was on defendant's property. Because what we're looking at, the meaning of the phrase generally accessible to motor vehicles is not dependent on the category of the driver. And that's where I think the Court of Appeals erred in this case, because they were trying to apply Fourth Amendment type issues when they're looking at the, the curtilage and, and the fact that this was defendant's own property. That is a separate issue. Defendant can always raise Fourth Amendment issues, but that is not the issue for us. Pure statutory analysis looking at the plain language of the statute, which says generally accessible to motor vehicles. How can a driveway not be generally accessible to motor vehicles, even if it's defendant's own private driveway or own vehicle? Thank you, Thank you Mr. You know, I just, I'm sorry, I just want to gather one other key thing, and I promise I'll stop asking questions, but I just, I'm really trying to, when we talk about general accessible, I, I just want to give you another quick hypothetical that I'm trying to think of, because does it matter the type of vehicle that you're, that you're operating, you know. Does it have to be a road? Does it have to be? What if I have? What if I? What if I have a large patch of land, and I'm in agriculture, and I'm a, I do farming, and that's my that's my business, that's my life. I'm I'm in agriculture. I guess my question would be is is that, let's say I'm operating my farm equipment, and I'm not drunk, but I'm just you know I have a beer, and I'm having a beer as I'm driving you know, my equipment on my property, right? So I'm, I'm doing the work that I'm doing. I'm not intoxicated, but I do have an open container. It's on my farm equipment. It's, you know, it's a hot day and I just want to have a beer. Is that generally accessible? Well, for one, the issue is whether he was under, he was operating while intoxicated. Having one beer is let's not necessarily say, operating while intoxicated. Okay, let's just say, let's just say hypothetically, let's just change hypothetical. Let's just say I'm operating my farm equipment. I'm, 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 I'm doing my work and I'm, I'm having a beer or two and fine, I'm over the legal limit, but I'm on my property, I'm on my farm, I'm doing my work. Is that generally accessible to law enforcement to then come well, on? Well, any, any area in the United States is generally accessible to law enforcement. The question is, is it no, a Fourth Amendment violation? I'm sorry? It comes down to whether there's a Fourth Amendment violation, uh, but any, the government can intrude on any piece of property in the state of Michigan under the, the police powers of No, the I understand, but, but under, that, under our analogy though, is that generally accessible under the conversation that we're having here? I, I, uh, for one thing, I'm not sure about farm equipment, if that would fall under the definition of a motor vehicle. Okay, then um, let's just change, I'm just trying to gather if I'm working on a farm, on a large area, and I'm operating whatever piece of equipment it is, and for the hypothetical situation, I am mildly intoxicated. But I'm on my property, I'm on my farm, I'm far away from absolutely everything, and I'm just doing my work. Is that generally accessible under the statute that we're talking about I, I guess you would have to, have to determine whether it is uh, a vehicle would be the first thing. Okay, let's um, say it's a vehicle. I'm, I mean, the, what type of vehicle is isn't really important. I'm trying to understand. Well, it, that, well, it is when you're talking about farm equipment and middle fields and it's only a farm. If you're talking about something like a pickup truck um, back, in, back in that area, even if we couldn't charge him, I'm not saying we can't, he can be charged with exact same criminal penalties under the um, Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act. The exact same penalties, a misdemeanor and a, a, a felony for a third offense. So why shouldn't we be able to charge for someone who's driving on their driveway a, a, a criminal offense when, when someone's on their back for it can be charged with exact same criminal offense? I think, it, you know, it did, your, your scenario is, is, is uh, somewhat problematic because of the whole farm field, but you know the the I, I, there may in my particular question, instances. My question, you know, my question is: there, my question, I just want to understand this question: Is a farm generally accessible under a scenario that I've given you? 
If there's no road that's getting to it, there's no road, but is it generally accessible? I don't, I don't want to make this so broad that, that people will cringe when they, when they read this case. Um, my, ar my, my argument, my rule would be, if it's usually or normally used or designed for vehicular traffic, then it would clearly fall into the statute. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Council. Ms. Barkovic? Thank you. May it please the court, Camilla Barkovic appearing on behalf of defendant FLE, Mr. Gino Ray. Um, we're here today uh, to determine whether or not the area upon which Mr. Ray operated his motor vehicle on the date in question uh, falls within the Michigan drunk driving statute. Um, obviously, this court's aware that there are three specific areas enumerated within the statute, uh, highway, area open to the public, or a place generally accessible to motor vehicles. Obviously, the third category is at issue in this case. The court is in a position to uh, interpret the law as written. The legislature is responsible for drafting the law, and uh, the court's main goal in interpreting any sort of legislation is to effectuate legislative intent. And in this case, I believe that the legislative intent is clear from the plain language or structure of the statutory provision. First and foremost, obviously, as I previously indicated, the statute specifically enumerates three categories. What that implies is that there are certain places the legislature did not intend to preclude drunk driving, and furthermore, that the legislature did not intend to criminalize drunk driving in all areas within the state. As I cite in my brief that I submitted to this court, um, the legislature could have simply indicated all areas within this state. Um, they did not do that, and they've clearly done that in other statutes. We've referenced some earlier this morning, um, but also the uh, commercial motor vehicle drunk driving statute precludes operating a commercial motor vehicle while intoxicated in all areas within the state. And what I find most interesting about that is the same exact legislature is the legislature that enacted the amendment to the OWI statute in 1992 and enacted um, or amended the drunk driving commercial motor vehicle statute to say all areas. So they clearly knew it. In addition, um, there are. Council, yes. Can I ask you, what areas are currently covered under the statute that, in your judgment, were not covered under the pre 1992 statute? Now, could you give an example of an area that is generally accessible to a motor vehicle, which is part of the new statute, but is not also open to the general public, which was the focus of the old statute? Yes, absolutely. Obviously, the old statute only precluded drunk driving on highways and then areas open to the general public. There are areas that are open or that are not open to the general public with which the new amendment obviously encompasses. Right. One of those would be, let's say, a private road. There was a case in the state of Michigan previously, City of Holland versus Dreyer, if I'm recalling correctly. It was a private road throughout a mobile home park. Uh, basically, generally only residents used the road, but it did um, cut off off a main thoroughfare, so that would be one. Another one would be like a gated community. Obviously, that is not open to the public. So a private road would be subject to coverage under the new statute, right? Yes. Even though it is arguably the case that that would be less accessible to most members of the public than would a driveway. Absolutely, but I think the problem that um, I guess maybe courts we're running into is people would maybe argue that simply because the general public wasn't able to access an area um, that they shouldn't be liable under the statute. And the thing is, there are areas where a large number of people, members of the public, or even I guess a private group of individuals may access, may be put at risk by this type of behavior. And I think that's what the amendment covered, are those specific areas. So let's say like a gated community. Well, there may be, let's, I guess, assume 20 homes in that community. So there's a limited number of individuals that reside there. There's a limited number of people that have access to that area. But still, uh, the roadway is generally accessible to motor vehicles because obviously it's more often than not uh, used for that purpose and by a large group of people. And I guess you need to interpret the statute in a way that effectuates 
the intent of the legislature and the public policy behind the statute. The public policy isn't simply to protect one person from his or her own conduct or a very, very limited number of people from their own conduct. It's the public at large. And that's why I think the legislature chose these three categories, because they ensure that the general public, the public at large, and public safety is protected. So is that – the test you seem to have articulated is um, – more often than not used by motor vehicles and used by a sufficient number of people. So the, the private road that in your gated community with 20 houses would meet both of those definitions, a sufficient number of people. But what if I have a private community and there are only two houses mm -hmm. in my little gate? Just me and Justice Viviano, because mm -hmm. we're the only two people who can get along or something like that. So we build a little <laughs> gated community, and mm -hmm. there's just the two, two families. Is that, does that count? Um, well, first of all, it sounds like a great community. Um, Thanks. <laughs> however... Is that because of her or me? Both. <laughs> both. Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, in that case, what you have to look at is the nature of the roadway. So there is a road, people are expected to be traveling on the road, and when you're on that road, you can expect to encounter other motor vehicles, whether or not two people reside there. In that circumstance, just because the roadway is private and only a few, I guess, people um, might have access to it, um, it's still of the nature that you can expect to, let's say, um, run into a drunk driver or something like that. A private the upper portion of the driveway in this case, um, which was encompassed within the backyard and side yard of the residence is different. The nature of the property is different, and I think that's what you need to look at. So it's your, I didn't understand, the Court of Appeals did rest its decision on the distinction between the upper part of the driveway and the lower part of the driveway. Right. But I didn't understand that to be your position. Is that your position? Does it make a difference whether it's the upper part of the driveway or the lower part of the driveway, or is it the whole driveway? I think, to be honest with you, I think it's a, a factually specific inquiry. And I think in this case, the area in question is not, it does not fall within the statute, but sure, perhaps areas closer down to the sidewalk, closer down to the roadway, where other people can be expected to be present is what, what's at issue. So, and just, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I just need to figure out what definition of generally we're supposed to apply. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, uh, you know, the, the, if, if generally means typically, then it's quite typical for your client to drive in and out of his driveway, I assume. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, if it means uh, a definition that has something to do with who has access to it, you know, the, the definition Justice Viviano asked mm -hmm. uh, opposing counsel about, or one of the common definitions is without distinction of one from others. And I think of a driveway as having a distinct, your, your driveway is for you and your invited guests, so it isn't necessarily for everybody. How, how do we pick which definition we use? Because I think with one you might win and one you might lose. Absolutely. Well, I think that clearly indicates that um, the statutory phrase at issue is ambiguous. And so my contention would be that it should be construed in favor of the defendant. Obviously, in my brief, I cite the rule of lenity. Um, clearly, it's my contention that this statute defines a criminal offense for the reasons I did set forth in my brief. And therefore, it should be construed uh, to exclude the conduct at issue. But jumping back, I mean, it is a difficult uh, decision to make, but once again, I think it's the nature of the property, and if you look at the underlying purpose of the statute, which is to protect society as a whole, rather than you from doing what you want on your own property. Well, if that's the purpose, you might, oh, I'm sorry, I already, it's, you guys go. You keep drawing to this uh, property or other people can be expected in public safety, but why is that? I mean, I, I've been around a while, and I've encountered a lot of drunk driving cases where it's a single vehicle accident that runs into a tree or a building or a home, why does it have, what, what in the language requires this? If it's, if it's public safety, isn't it also the safety of the operator of the vehicle? So uh, I don't see where you're getting this notion that if, if it's an area where other people are around, okay, that there's, you know, you're, you're under the statute, but if not, then you're free to harm yourself? Well, I guess the issue then becomes um, 
I guess looking at the nature of the roadway. Like if you're on a highway, obviously there are higher speeds that are that cars are able to reach. Um, if you're on another roadway, obviously the car would generally be mobile. In this circumstance and in the upper portion of a driveway, you're not traveling at speeds or in any manner that you could really cause a substantial risk. And if anything, it is your own property that's truthfully at risk and you are entitled. I mean, people have an interest. Your own property, though. What about isn't the like like what about exactly like what about if you have children? What about if I mean what about the idea that it's not just the actual individual, as Justice Zara was talking to, but let's expand it. What about other residents of the family? What about of a child or a spouse or an animal? Or a police officer executing a search warrant within the habits of the country. Absolutely. Well, I mean, the bottom line is um, if the legislature did intend to ensure the public of every single person that absolutely may be at risk from this sort of conduct, they would have said anywhere within the state. And other legislatures have done that, or specifically didn't. They knew they could, and I think that's, it says a lot. Because obviously, this court can't sit in the position to decide what the best policy is. That's the legislature's job. They set forth what they intended in the express language of the statute. And I'm just asking the court, uh, based on uh, what I've articulated earlier, to construe this in a manner to effectuate that intent. Because if this court were to construe the statute to include the conduct or area at issue, then there's no place within this state that the statute wouldn't apply. So effectively, this court would be rewriting legislation, which obviously, with all due respect to the court, that's not the court's job. So, Council, in what place of the state should it, should it apply? I mean, I guess my question would be, I like to ask it in the other context. So, where, so ultimately, where should it apply then? You know, what, what would the extension be to you? As I asked, you know, your sister council, you know, when I asked her the question, which is, tell me an area that isn't generally accessible. Give me an example of a place that is not generally accessible. The Other than this situation, I mean, this specific driveway in this specific circumstance, you know, where do I draw a line to say, okay, you know what, this is not generally accessible? I think uh, what you proposed earlier, uh, driving on uh, secluded farmland, you own a lot of property, clearly anything can be accessible. And this jumps to some of the questions you had asked Sister Council is, um, the inclusion of the term generally. Obviously, it was intentional. My contention is that it limits the scope and applicability of the statute because technically anywhere is accessible. If you look at accessible, it means ability to enter. If I want to drive my car through a physical barrier and place myself, let's say, in someone's backyard, I guess it's accessible. Or if I want to plow through your farmlands to get to the area where you are, I have access to that, technically speaking. However, the statute and the language utilized in the current statute um, clearly indicates that that's not what the legislature intended. Council, just as my colleagues have inquired about the meaning of the word generally, I'd like to inquire just a little bit more about the meaning of the word accessible. Accessible has several different understandings. One is that it's permissible to do something. Another is that uh, something accessible has drivability. It can be entered. It can be driven on. To the extent that accessible focuses on permission, it seems to me it's increasingly tantamount to the other clause in this statute, that is whether or not there is uh, something that is um, open to the, the general public. To the extent that that's true, accessibility must connotate some sense of drivability. Is it something that can be driven on? In which case, there'd be absolutely no basis for a distinction between the upper and the lower part of the driveway. What does accessible mean to you precisely? Well, if it's something, and I, I will address your question, but if it's something about how you have simply indicated that it's able to be driven upon, then once again, the legislature could have just said any area within this state, because technically any area within this state is able to be driven upon. A badly maintained road might not be easy to be driven on, for example. Right, but it is still able to be driven on. Um, and What does accessibility mean to you, precisely? I don't believe that it means physical ability to enter. I think that it should be confined and may be confined to the issue of uh, implied permission or uh, 
And you think that that, that largely tracks and duplicates and is redundant of the other clause in the, in the statute? No, I don't. And if we're looking at redundancy, I mean, a highway, technically, by definition, under the Motor Vehicle Act, is open to the public. Then you have, subsequent to that, open to the public as a separate category. Um, then now we get to generally accessible, and uh, I, I think it covers areas that aren't open to the public. And so obviously that would be areas where people don't have permission to go into. And generally um, speaking, um, there are several areas, like I articulated earlier, perhaps like a private roadway, or how in Nickerson it was a private uh, speedway. They obviously had to pay an admission fee to get in to that area, so the general public wasn't allowed, but at the same time, uh, people, a large portion of the community would be at risk by conduct. So, Council, I have a question, though, because we're trying to look at this not just as it pertains to your client, but just for how these cases are going to be enforced across the state. And I guess my question would be is, in the scenario that we have here, how should law enforcement have done this differently? Um, how should law enforcement have What should the police done? officer have done differently in this case? Um, I don't think that he should have entered Mr. Ray's property. The area in question um, was extremely private in nature, was intimate but, to but the But the home. question is, so then, if the police officer is concerned about the fact that, wow, this person could go onto the road and really hurt some folks, what would you have liked the officer to have done? Should he have just left? But I don't think the officer had that thought because there was no indication that Mr. Ray ever intended to leave his property. There were three instances in this case, and all of them involved him playing music. So I guess if we get into that, clearly officers, and I will acknowledge that officers, if they uh, observe the commission of some sorts of crimes, may enter to investigate. However, um, in this case, it would have been limited to the music, the noise violation. So if the police officer sees him in the car and, you know, sees him with the engine on and sees that the car has moved and the police officer is not allowed to take any, your argument would be that the police officer can't take any steps at that point to um, protect the public? Well, that would, he would be speculating. I mean, that's just assuming that Mr. Ray would have left his residence. And it's my contention, obviously, that that doesn't fall within the drunk driving statute, so the police officer wouldn't have an ability to essentially arrest him for that conduct. What the police officer should have done is came up to him and issued him a citation for perhaps disorderly conduct, uh, a noise violation maybe under a city ordinance. But there's no indication that he ever intended to leave the residence, and that's evidenced by his prior conduct on the night in question. Could a police officer make an arrest if the individual is driving drunk? and they get to their private property, they get onto their, their, their driveway, um, it's not, and we agree that it's not accessible, we're like just taking this as a hypothetical, would a police officer be able to make arrests for drinking and driving if the actual kind of determination was made on private property? It, under your definition, the property is not generally accessible. Could the police officer then effectuate an arrest if that person drove onto the property? Well, no, I disagree with you because the area, the only time the area is relevant is to the area of operation. Right. So if he's, obviously in that hypothetical, the police officer would have had to observe him traveling on a highway. Let's say he or, did. Let's say he did. I'm just telling, the question is when he makes the actual stop and he effectuates the sobriety, is he allowed to do that? Under I, your definition, I if think it's actually, not generally accessible, I think, he have to do it before he gets to that location. So if he gets to that location, is he then free? No, because he had operated the vehicle on areas prior to that location that fall within the statute. So I understand what you're getting at, basically sliding into home base, you're clear, free. That's, that's not applicable to this situation because in this situation, obviously, Mr. Wright was never operating anywhere but the upper portion of I guess you would say his driveway, which is encompassed within his backyard and side yard of his residence. And so when you look, the operation has to occur in one of the statutorily enumerated areas, not the arrest. Ms. Barker, Mr. your time is up. Thank you. Um, Ms. Dillon, your time is also uh, expired. So this case will be submitted.
you know, that's the kind of thing that you know, and, uh, you know, for the building and you know, for the house and the property that you've seen us. So we'll look forward to seeing you at the reception later. Thank you.